Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting people. I am your host, Christopher Hart. Now this week, we make a trip to Louisville. Uh, it is Louisville, so I'm told. Uh, I try to make it up there probably three, four times a year, Nashville a couple times a year for barrel picks, and we actually went up there to pick a Four Roses uh, for our whiskey event, the Houston Whiskey Social on February 8th. Tickets are on sale. Um, Google Houston Whiskey Social, check it out on Eventbrite. Uh, of course, you can find it on Facebook, but we went up there to pick our Four Roses barrel for the event. Now, I have some bad news for those of you who bought Pappy tickets. Now, historically, we're not allowed to legally advertise that we will give you a bottle uh, for the event if you buy a certain ticket, because then that means that we're technically selling you a bottle. However, once you've already bought in that bought in that ticket, purchased that ticket, bought that ticket, I'm allowed to then tell you, hey, by the way, we're, we're giving you a gift. So Pappy Van Winkle ticket holders and Buffalo Trace Antique collection ticket holders have historically received a special bottle. Pappy specifically uh, usually get the Four Roses uh, single barrel that we select for the year. Here's the, uh, the catch. Unfortunately, it's not going to be bottled in time. Now, feel free to shoot me an email, to shoot me a Facebook message. We can talk about it. We have a plan, no, no worries. You may not get it that night, but whenever our barrel comes in, the Four Roses barrel, we'll go ahead and we'll set one aside for you to pick up whenever you can. Uh, or we have another thing, um, and I don't know if this has been officially announced, but we are, we've essentially started a brand for our event. We've started independent bottling single cask items um, under our own label. It's not out yet. Don't go looking for colas. They're not. It hasn't been approved yet. Um, but we plan to uh, import. We are. It's not a plan. We are importing uh, several single barrel, sixteen year old Guyana rum barrels. Uh, which we're also doing a four square barrel, two four square barrels at twelve years, and a and a Belize barrel. So, uh, starting off with about five different barrels of single cask rum. All age stated, all cast strength, no added colorings, no added nothing, just straight to the cask. And of course, it, the the value, the price of these bottles are going to be more than the Four Roses. So what we hope to do is feature these rums at the event. And for the Pappy ticket holders, we plan to give you the option. We can give you a bottle that night, or you can wait to get your Four Roses if you're not a rum person. Totally understand. But we will, we do plan to continue this trend and kind of import new things. We're working on some scotch. We're working on some Armagnac. It's, it's going to be a, a fun thing. So our guests today are two thirds of the hosts of the official podcast of Bourbon, Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. We are joined by Ryan Cecil, an author, personality, and chief editor of Bourbon Plus Magazine, Mr. Fred Minnick. Thank you, Joe Heron, for the incredible Copper and Kings hospitality. I wanted to talk to you about what's happening at Copper and Kings on December 6th and 7th, and that is called Bookstock. Bookstock is a gathering of the world's finest spirits and cocktail writers for Friday and Saturday at Copper and Kings. Kind of a play on Woodstock. If you know how much Copper and Kings loves music, you'd appreciate that. There's one last thing I want to talk to you guys about, and that's on December 6th and 7th. Uh, it's called Bookstock. It's happening at Copper and Kings Distillery. Uh, it's a gathering of the world's finest spirits and cocktail writers. Obviously, you can't have an event like that without Mr. Fred Minnick there himself. Uh, and the event is just going to be two days loaded up of seminars and discussions with some of the most influential cocktail and uh, spirits authors ever currently live obviously and uh yeah so i i, I really check that out uh go to if you're in louisville december 6th and 7th and of course if you live there go see it go check it out and talk to some of the most incredible people that have changed the shape of spirits today so yeah let's jump into this week's sponsors so this week's show is as always sponsored by trilado distillers and spirits 
leader in premium artisan products like Bunohaven, Deanston, Lechegg, Tobermory, Baines, Black Bottle, and of course, Scottish Leader. You can pick up the entire line at your local liquor store, or if you are a retailer, reach out to your United Wine and Spirits rep. Whiskey Neat is supported by the Inspired Spirits at Glass Rev Imports and Murray McDavid. The historic Colburn Distillery Whiskey Storehouse in the heart of Speyside is packed to the brim with thousands of whiskey casks. There, the Whiskey Creations team apply their crafts to age, finish, blend, and bottle unique statements of the greatest Scottish whiskeys born of raw casks from the greatest distilleries past and present. Are these expressions of legendary whiskeys a result of art, science, or perhaps a little of both? Discover inspired Scotch whiskeys from Murray McDavid today. Boom, that's a little better, right? Without further ado, Ryan Cecil and Fred Minnick of Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Cheers. Fred, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, man, pleasure. Absolutely. Ryan? Thanks, Chris. I'm glad you guys could be here. I know we... uh, Got the two best parts of uh, Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, no, no, we're, we're the, bad. like, of the tripod, Kenny's probably the sturdiest. Yeah, we're kind of I mean, loose. If, and if, uh, <laughs> if, if, if it was up to Ryan and I, we'd probably have one episode a month. You yeah. Know, Kenny cracks the whip like he's, you would, don't even know. He's the most efficient guy in yeah. podcasting that I know of. I mean, the. He's incredible. Even the one time I came on, he sent uh, this incredible, like, pre email of what we're going to talk about. Oh, yeah. And, like, he, he he makes his own flow charts and like to do's for oh like my gosh, recording our, equipment and like what you need, what you need to have like your computer our, ready. It's our incredible. Google Docs, like our Google Docs, oh. for the whole thing for the for the show. It's like it's like you ask a question. It's like it's in Google Google Docs. I'm like Kenny, I'm never gonna look in Google Docs. <laughs> well, I think in Google Docs you get like ten or thirteen gigabytes or something. Sure. And Bourbon Pursuit takes about eight. Eight gigabytes. Eight terabytes. Of, of no, like, I had to. I actually, like it, it overflowed mine, and I had to. Uh, I had to like get a new account, like upgrade, ju- Up, just upgrade for, your prescription, yeah, just for Bourbon Pursuit. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, so shout out to Kenny. Yeah, uh, shout without out to him, Kenny, man. Wish yeah. he could be here. Love but, that guy. But it's nice to be able to talk without. Not I know, right? <laughs> Finally, <laughs> this is how we can talk about what we want. <laughs> how different the perspective is. I forgot to start a timer. That's see, I'm no Kenny. That's for sure. No, see, I would, I would do the same like, thing. He's, he's our new Kenny. Yep. <laughs> for God's sake, Chris. <laughs> so uh, you guys, it's funny, you guys started, what, two years ago, three years ago? 2015, what, March of 2015 was when Kenny and I first did our first episode in my basement. Sure. Was, uh, and then... Uh, you're, you're the the basement that's that famous bar set up that sometimes people will... Oh no, that's Kenny's basement. Kenny's basement. <laughs> of course, everything comes back to Kenny. But uh, <laughs> he's got an incredible collection, so it's nice to have. But no, this was like that was even before he lived in that house, and so yeah, uh, yeah that that was we kind of I had this idea of listening. I love podcasts because I'm in my truck a lot for my existing job, and there wasn't really any on bourbon that were interesting. There were a couple, you know, that a guy's sitting around talking about tasting notes and like then rambling on a bunch of stuff. And I was sure. like, this is like dreadful. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, just growing up in Bardstown, I knew a lot of people in the industry. I knew Fred because I do, did his yard. I knew he had a lot of influence in the industry. So I reached out a little to Fred. Bit, sure. Fred was one of the first people I reached out to about it. Mm-hmm. And um, he hooked, he, he graciously invited us to Churchill Downs. Like they were doing a legend series where they're interviewing Harlan yeah. Wheatley. Mm-hmm. So we show up with our MacBook this is before Kenny was like, had it all figured out. We show up with our MacBook, put a mic, like plug it in right next to him, hit record, and we're like, all right, we're set. Then we go back, listen to it, we go through the whole thing, and then we go back and we're like, oh no, it didn't record. Like nothing recorded. You did the whole thing. <laughs> we did the whole thing and it didn't record. And so it's like, yeah, that was uh, an epic fail on our part. But There's a bit of growing pains for sure. I mean, just, and then also eventually you get to the point where you realize that this is forever. It's an, an, it theoretically indefinite. So yeah. you don't know, uh, you have to produce something every single week. And if you don't, you, you lose an audience. You can't build an audience if you're not consistent. So it's, it's yeah, you weird... got to keep them engaged, you know, and then and Kenny does a great job. We, we actually record stuff in batches. So we'll go and take like three weeks every six months and we'll record about 20 or so in batches and then that way we have content and him and his wife can uh edit them as we you know want I mean, to release it, it really is fascinating like how how great of a job kenny does of of like organizing bourbon pursuit you know i came on um 
year and a half ago, is that right? Yep. Year and a half ago. And my whole thing is like, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer. I, I'm not a, you know, and I, did, I do events and and some TV stuff, and I wanted to, I wanted to get a strong flex podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm important. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, well, the TV thing is weird. It's like, you know, I mean. You're the most savage person on TV, too, by the way. I came to your, your Maker's Mark uh, episode of that show. Was it Top Chef or something? Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was the most brutal. You were there, too, right? Yeah, yeah. Todd's off camera, but you were the yeah. most brutally savage. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I'm afraid. I've never asked you what you think of things because I'm afraid of what might come out of your mouth. <laughs> well, I. It's never. He is a critic. It, it, it's never. It's never to be offensive or anything. It's just honest and like and 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 in television they they need bites. You know they need sound bites. They need quick hitting. Um, and fortunately, my entire career has been built on brevity in terms of my writing style. Like if you look at my sentences, they're they're short. You know it's by design. It's because I come from a newspaper background. So I think in like, and that's why Twitter's, I, I, I really gravitated toward Twitter is because, you know, if you are a passive voice, you know, writer, you don't do well on Twitter. You have to, you have to have an active voice like constantly. So you have to know how to use verbs and so forth. But, um, but like I, I came to Kenny and, and Ryan, I wanted to do a podcast. But I didn't want to do a podcast. I wanted, to, I, I wanted to do one, yeah. but I didn't want to have to actually do all the work that comes with it. And uh, I mean, we had, and then, and I was, I was kind of nervous. I've never told you this, Ryan, but I was really nervous about about meeting with you guys. Oh, really? That day. Yeah. We, so the we, first day. Yeah. So well, no, actually, I I asked to meet meet with them because I'd been on their podcast numerous times, and I had roped them into the Legend series, so they recorded all the Legend series that I did. I've been doing it since 2013, and get all the people at the Churchill Downs and interview them. And uh, all those episodes have been recorded by Bird Pursuit. And I had basically, at this point, at this point in my career, I was like, I had a magazine, or I was about to have a magazine. I had a TV show, or about to have a TV show. I had all these things. And I'm kind of looking at like, my portfolio of media or what what have you and i'm like i don't have a fucking podcast and i was like i really really want a podcast and i love these two like i mean i really really love them like they're great human beings and they're really good at at their style and they're very um you guys have evolved i, I hate to say yeah, the words they, figure to make it but you guys started off branding yourself well, they'll, as the they'll tell you they fake oh it. absolutely yeah. <laughs> like i mean listen to me talk do i sound like uh you know you're trained like tv you yeah, know he, uh ryan kind is of. the people's champion don't never forget that everyone wants to hear more of ryan i know you've kind of started this like thing like i, I don't understand how i i guess maybe because i am authentic and i try to be real you well i'm not really trying nice. i'm just real like you, you uh, come off as a human you come off as yeah, a real like there's no i mean again not to not to blow up kenny but his his voice has become very much a uh, uh bourbon pursuit but like it's, oh, it's like for sure. very <laughs> professional right exactly and you are the opposite where you just sound like yeah like, yeah this is delicious i like this and you know it's not it's not super um uh, dressed up like you sure. you're just a you're you're Ryan, right? Yeah, also, for sure. I mean, I'll be mid sentence and like forget what I'm saying and like <laughs> looking for thoughts and I'm like, uh, uh and Kenny will just kind of like help me finish sure, it or sure. wrap up my thoughts just uh but I'm getting as you do it and get more on the mic, it's like everything. You can master a skill. You yeah. just need to put time into it. And so as time's evolved, I've gotten more comfortable talking and being in front of people and being on a mic. But uh yeah, it's definitely been one of my favorite things about Ryan is that he can be savage too, you know. So he will, he will totally just rip you a new one if uh, <laughs> if he feels the need to. And that and that was like going into that meeting I was telling you about. That's one of the things I was nervous about. I basically went to him and I said, "Hey guys, I'm either going to start a podcast or I would like to join Burn Pursuit." And that's kind of how it started. And yeah. they were, and they were like, kind of like, "Good God, we'd we'd love to work with you." And, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean that's a huge. It came boost. at a. Yeah, it came at a critical point because we had kind of started to see some success um, with the Patreon community. Like distilleries and brands were starting to take us serious, but we, but a lot of people still weren't taking us serious and wouldn't even answer our calls when 
you know, they're like a podcast, whatever. And so that's a, that's the problem. Even when I, sorry to interrupt you, but when I, no, no, go ahead. when I approach, uh, people for interviews, uh, I, I don't care about being on the radio, but I'll lean on that because for some reason that gets a bit more credibility. Sure. Than, well, they say ESPN, you know, yeah, the, these, the, in Houston. the distillery is kind of an old school mindset about marketing and advertising the, they, they don't understand that their newest consumer is millennials and younger people who are not on TV, they're not pay, t- paying attention to cable. They're not, you know, doing like traditional advertising. They're doing YouTube. They're doing podcasts. They want stuff yeah. that they can decide what they're listening or watching to. And at, so, at their own convenience. At their right? own convenience. And so, um, anyways, but so Fred had already built those relationships, and we felt like we kind of reached a peak at what we could do in the bourbon industry. So it was like a no-brainer for us to for Fred to join us, and we've been so thrilled and it's been a great working relationship he's i mean giving us a little bit of celebrity status like sure just getting adds, us to go to metallica you know bourbon beyond putting us on panels i mean it's really helped elevate you know from being this kind of like underground you know podcast for bourbon to kind of like a serious player in the media game and so we're we're very grateful and thankful and i think it's important to know i've learned a lot from these two um you know and it's also you, know, you kind of, you know, I've been doing this for almost 15 years now. I've been writing about whiskey in some shape or fashion. And, uh, you know, these guys reinvigorated me for, like, from from a fan perspective. Um, I was, you know, there's, there's a reason why I wrote a rum book and a mead book. Um, I wouldn't say I was bored. But I need I, I constantly look for challenges. And like when I wrote uh, Bourbon, the Rise, Fall and Rebirth of American Whiskey, I mean, I covered so many pieces of, of like bourbon history and everything that had never been covered before. And I was just kind of I came out of that book. I was and I was kind of depressed because I was like, I can't write another you know bourbon book because I, I, I can never top this book. And so. I had to find new ways to be able to talk about my passion and 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 really you know Ryan I you 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 and Kenny I mean you guys what you guys have done for me of like of of like um bringing out some of that enthusiasm yeah I think that I used to have I think we've noticed that as well like you 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 know in your career what you as a writer and you you kind of have to be serious or take your and work kind of more of a this is fun hobby for us and sure. we keep it that way. And it's kind of brought Fred back into that. Why you get interested in bourbon anyways, it's for fun. It's to, yeah. you know, hang out with friends and try different things and all that stuff. So we definitely, I've noticed that, you know, bringing that fun back for you. And, and, and I, and it really, it's what it's about. Cause I love this. I, I love this. And if I wasn't writing about it, I would still be involved in it, you know, in some way or shape or form. And, and, uh, I do miss, I miss the days where I could just be in like, Facebook forums and stuff. <laughs> sure. You know, I miss that a lot. And I, I sometimes hate the fact that I've grown into what I am because it, it, it has taken away a lot of that joy of just being able to get in there and interact and, and just, you know, cut it up with people because, uh, you know, everyone's like, you fucking killed Henry McKenna <laughs> <laughs> or, something, or yeah. something like that, you know? And I'm like, you ruined my whiskey for me. And yeah. it's like, all right, well, you know, I, I'm not going to. Res- yeah, I appreciate you. You you feel that way. I'm bye. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? And I know this may seem like a, a stretch, but be, I, I would say that most people, most of our listeners, most of our watchers, maybe have not been in this for a, a long time. Sure. Like the yeah. Last five to ten years. Uh, even less, right? So, do you think that the next step? Do you have aspir- aspirations? A, a, what's the word? aspirations? Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, of becoming Bourbon Hall of Fame, Fred Minnick. Uh, I have no, uh, so th- there is no criteria for what's Bourbon Hall of Fame. It's controlled by uh, the Kentucky Bourbon Festival and Kentucky Distillers Association. And I mean, you know, but, but I don't your feel impact like on bourbon is undeniable. The, the fa- I mean, the fact I that people. I appreciate that, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like I belong in the Hall of Fame. I feel like, uh, you know, I've got, you know, another 10, 15 years. There is no criteria for it, but I think it should be like the standards for me should be like, you're at least for 20, 25 years. Um, well, well, let me let me get, let me defend you for a minute. So, for those who don't know, this wouldn't be a first. People were probably kind of scoffing. At least some people are like, "Why would he? He doesn't even make bourbon." 
it doesn't matter. Chuck Cowdery was in Bourbon Hall of Fame. I think he was in the first couple of years. Uh, he got, yeah, he got in. 2011 uh, or something? I think he was nine. Two, I, think, I think he was in, he was in Edwin Foote's class, I think. I don't know. The impact yeah. you've had on this uh, hobby, uh, like you said, people have blamed you for making Henry McKenna. Uh, <laughs> there were people who bought cases of it and it's tried to Fred flip Minnick it. It's the Fred effect, you know. It's like you, I mean, you have the, op- the Oprah effect, you know. It's like it's, you say something. You've had a it, really great well, support mm-hmm. role. I mean, yes, people have been making bourbon for years, but we're in an age of bourbon that's unprecedented, yeah. and, it, and it wouldn't – it's because I think, and I think you deserve a bit more credit for those who might, let's say, write you off. Uh, because you know, not that not that many people write you off, but we've talked about it. Like the thing that fuels you to keep going when yeah. when someone wants to not, you know, give you any credit for something, and uh, you've you've had this undeniable impact that I think would. I mean, look at what you're doing now, podcasting. You've got your YouTube channel. You, you've, as far as I know, you're probably one of the most followed bourbon influencers on. Um, Twitter, right? And in and, and, and general, um, th- you've written several books. I think that counts, right? Who else so, is doing something at that level besides so you? I was just at this, um, at this conference. It was, it was about music festivals, and they asked me to come and talk. Um, and it was about content. They asked me about my role in content. And, and there's all these terms, like influencer and content. I hate that term. You know, and <laughs> I it's just like, term. you know, I, I go back to the, I'm just a writer, you know, like I have really in my head, I'm still just a writer and I feel, you know, I appreciate what you said. I really do. But I don't really feel any of that. Like I hate, I hate that, you know, I go into a liquor store and I'm going to buy something. There's like people, fucking people watching me, you know, <laughs> Um, What's he so gonna what, pick? What, what am I buying, or like what I'm, what am I ordering? And and you know, you should order a pina colada. I do that all the time. If I'm out in public, I you know, pina colada has a lot of calories, and I'm not like you. I'm fat. Man, I, I love don't know, pina man. coladas. This shirt's a little tighter than I'm I trying to, I'm trying to lose some weight. Pina coladas go straight to the hips. It's delicious, though. good stuff, man. Of course, but yeah. you feel like people are watching you when you. Well, I, no, it, it's it happens, and you know, I miss the times where I didn't have that. Um, and I do all this stuff because, like, I feel like I, I just, I, like, I have to. Like, I love it. I love it. And if I don't do it, and then and also I'm being, you know, um, kind of contradictory of myself of, like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily like the attention that comes with a lot of this stuff, but I feel like I have to do all this stuff. I, I, it, it's weird. Like, <laughs> That's how it is with any... Uh, I, I'm with any celebrity. I'm not trying to, I know that term may bother yeah. you like the term influencer might bother me, but the, the people go into acting cause they have a passion for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and then there's this side effect that is unfortunate. I just, I don't know if you ever watch hot ones, but Kristen Stewart just did hot ones. And she talked about this side effect of you, you, there's this great quote from, um, is it Alice in Wonderland, I believe? But the Queen of Hearts basically uh, says, no, no, sentence first, then uh, uh, sentence, uh, punishment first, then sentence, or whatever, or, or whatever, I forget the term. Before you get sentenced, you get um, convicted. We'll just say that. So yeah. she's like, no, 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 punish them, then convict them. Like, let's, let's, there's this thing that happens when you're a celebrity where your life, everything you do, anytime you say something is like, when you announce that this is the whiskey of the year, that this one, the San Francisco, right? So when yeah, it's magnified, it's <laughs> it's magnified, and people are willing to immediately get upset at you for, for just saying that this one, as you know, right? Blame you for something as if all you're doing is passing along a message of you know. And I always want people to feel like they can blame me or you know be pissed at me. I I never want to. I I really don't get upset about that. Um, it, it's the the only thing that ever ever bothers me is when uh you know people like um you know make comparisons to me to another critic or someone that they know you know that um you know may not I, i'm very honest and i do not um i don't take money from from brands for my reviews or anything You're like that talking about can i say it or do you rather uh, not say it yeah i mean I, you can say whatever you want but like <laughs> i know me and and Ryan and Kenny know me, and like, and uh, you're not taking money from brands. No, 
Right. So when you say something is good, it's because you objectively yeah. feel that way. Now, in 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 fairness, like like the, the media properties that I'm a part of do take advertising from brands, but that money is not directly coming to me. That's like, it's going to bourbon pursuit. Right, and you have no obligation one way or the other not to not zero. say something. There is nothing, um, um, I have never been paid by a brand to say, to, to make a, uh, a positive comment about them, never. And, like, no. and, and when I have given reviews that were very, um, um, honest and not, honest, not and glowing. it went went well for for the brand. They've offered to pay me a licensing fee, and I've I've denied it. So uh, you know, so they could use my name and likeness. I may I may be, I may say something like, "Yeah, you can use my name in your marketing or something," but I will not take their money for it. Sure. And uh, you know, I'm not saying there. There's media. Media is its own beast, and so there's a lot of media that will accept that. But the reviewers. Um, the reviewers are not the ones getting that money. And that's one of the things that, that like, um, you know, as when I, when I see people bashing critics and everything, um, you know, I always, I always think of like, I know how difficult it is to be a critic. And so I like to think that no one is doing that in our business. Um, you know, I know it's come out and like taking money for yeah for so, long reviews. Yeah, and I have I have never I have never heard of a critic in this space doing that. Sure. Would you out them if you did? Like, if you um, knew for sure that this critic or that critic was taking money, would you say, "Look, this is the thing that I hate"? Because there's a thing I about you. I, yeah, I. There's this thing about you that comes across as uh, you remind me of Wade uh, in the fact that Wade has a line of morality. And he, if he police feels, man, you know, yeah. policing the everything. If yeah. he feels like someone is being immoral, yeah, and profiting off it, and that comes with manipulation of like the consumer, yeah, Wade draws a line, and there's this thing like. By like, the way, we're featuring Wade in the next issue of uh, Bourbon Plus, and we we did the you know the wing photo that you guys did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard we, about we it. We did a. That's his. Uh, Todd, wow, that's Todd did that. <laughs> yeah, Todd did all the artwork for that. Wow, we did. That's a, awesome. We did an illustration on it. So oh, very like, cool. We, we turned that into like a graphic, and, he, and it's like it's really nice. <laughs> we, yeah. we even used we Wade the potatoes, uh, but we we relied on Wade heavily when we started our own private brand, sourcing you know yeah. different whiskeys, and because we colas. yeah, just because we wanted to be you know we're whiskey consumers too. We wanted to be as transparent and everything, and we did just want to make sure because we knew that somebody would point something out. So Wade, we were like. Please help us make sure that we cover, dot all our I's, cross our T's, and stuff. So Wade was instrumental in that. But back to your, yeah, Wade is Wade's very black and white with that stuff. Yeah, and that's how you come across. I mean, even um, during the interview with the count, the counterfeiting episode, you were very upset. And yeah, I, I regret that interview. <laughs> really? I regret it for how I treated Kenny and Ryan. Um, oh, you didn't do anything to me. Well, I you, guys were... you know, I, I just, I was, I was so fucking upset. And that, and, and really, I should have recused myself. So, so just to give some people some context about that episode where Fred, you know, was clearly passionate about. Um, so this individual contacted us. He kind of wanted to, you know, clear his conscience, kind of get it off his chest. He was, you know, it had been a couple years. And so we, I, I thought, took of it as let's use this as an opportunity to show the community that, counterfeiting you know has happens its effects, yeah. has its effects and the consequences so i was in hopes to deter somebody from doing it again and to you know enlighten individuals on that it is a possibility and so i my, wanted my to, first thought is that it's also probably going to be the one of the most watched episodes you guys have ever probably <laughs> and the most controversial it already has been and so sure. um and you know fred didn't want to do the show um rightfully so i mean and for the reasons you know don't want to give this guy a platform, you know, sure. and all this stuff. Cause he, you know, what he did was terrible. Um, and I kind of took it from, you know, educate, but I also wanted like, Hey, let's just, I don't know. It, it has a lot to do with my faith. I think I want people to have second chances. I, you know, we all mess up. It might not be as severe as counterfeiting bottles, but yeah, we all screw up and yeah. you know, it's like, who am I to throw the stone? Let's use this as a positive to sure. help, Take a negative and help it to where it doesn't. And here, you know. And so you had so to paint a picture for the room 
uh, Kenny's on my left, uh, Ryan's on my right, and I, it, it's true, like, I didn't want to do this episode, um, but I said I would, and well, I'm a man of my word, if I say I want to do something to include coming to Copper and Kings uh, at 8 in the morning, you know. I appreciate you. Uh, I will. Um, you know, and, and so, like, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. You know, sure. Another, sure. another market. No worries. Sorry. Market. I, the military, I can't get the cussing out. Oh, it's um, okay. I mean, it'll be uncensored for podcasts, but. But I sit in there, and I in my head, I'm going to be like, all right, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to be a very reasonable person. Um, I'm going to ask these questions about how he did it. You know, did he scrape off labels? Like, what was, you know, I was, that's I was where I was going to go because I'm a collector. Sure. And, um. And then I sit in front of the guy and I'll look in his eyes and I'm just red. Like I yeah. am feeling the fire and I'm just like all of my journalistic uh, principles just out the window. And the first thing I asked was like, why aren't you in jail? And I'm yeah. like, I have never in my career, um, do you know, I, I felt been as unprofessional as I was on that set to as because I was I was unprofessional to Kenny and Ryan because they were trying to get it to go down that direction. <laughs> well, we're, sure. we're very unprofessional, so but, it, it fits in. But it, but you know, you guys, no, you're not. You're very professional. But I was, um, I, w- I was, um, you weren't thinking clearly. I, I was a dick, you know, and I was not not to not to well not to be fair to fred i mean this guy did some egregious stuff right and like and there was you know the people that happened to they didn't have that opportunity to face this person there's and also some to, inconsistencies in some of the stuff he said that, yes that didn't make sense and by the way i you know if you if you've ever looked through all of our texts <laughs> and our, our conversations i always say i was a dick to you guys i never say i was a dick to that guy <laughs> sure because i don't in terms of like um if i'm in a one-on-one if, if i'm in a room by, by myself with that guy I don't know if I'm coming. I mean, I, I think it's a very different conversation. And, um, you know, and that's like, that's everything that he said to me was contradictory. And like, I, I've had a lot of people say like, I'm a Christian and I believe in forgiveness. I, I do too. But forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. Sure. And forgiveness uh, does not mean necessarily forgetting. And I don't see what this guy ever did to you know, to pay a price. And, and, that, and I think that is like, I never really, I couldn't get past, uh, and even now I'm getting very passionate about it, but I could not get past that, like, that personal, um, that personal feeling in my gut of like, this guy did so much more and, and well, he hasn't paid a single thing for it. You it know, the interview him. itself was his attempt at trying to, fix things right to make his life a little bit easier because it's been rough and so i guess if you were to be i'm not completely cynical but i could see some people saying okay so then the interview was a pr move on his part to try to make things easier he has no obligation to be honest or transparent and the inconsistency that i saw the most which make perfect sense is he you guys which by the way i loved i think it was kenny that asked the question i love that you guys specifically addressed have you ever faked pappy Mm-hmm. And he said yeah. no. He said all the bottles he had faked were in that three hundred, four hundred dollar range. And he said he had faked a total number of like thirty or so bottles. And then when you guys asked him how much he made for the year, gross, he said seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> right. Thirty bottles at three hundred dollars a piece doesn't equal seventy thousand sure. dollars. But it, it went. Oh, I don't think you guys caught it because of the intensity of the moment, right? Yeah. I've made mistakes. Well, it, it, I mean, to be, I mean, it was so awkward in that room. Like, I could not <laughs> wait for it to be over. Like, just, I mean, uh, well, and, and th- Fred, I, I, you know, you brought up the Christian thing. I, I just want to make clear, I don't want you to feel guilty about the way, like, and I, that's I don't think what it was that I was bad. going I really into. Don't think it was that bad. So that's why I was going. You, that's or, why or I Ryan, wanted to do the episode. Are you, are you forgiving me for the episode? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not. There's no divine intervention or anything. I'm, uh, ca- I'm Catholic, I, so I, no. I get guilt. No, no, you know? and you know it was so awkward and like sure. we, yeah. you know, he, even well, Kenny, he well. who was very, you know, methodical, and was we're like just I'm sweating, he's sweating. Like <laughs> as soon as I'm like <laughs> about to jump uh, across the table, dude. I was worried. I. I I was worried that he, because Fred was poking the bear so much, I was worried he was going to get violent. And that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I just thought, Uh, you know, well, he's a criminal and you just, (laughs) I I think so. But, uh, (laughs) 
I, I, that's what I was most nervous about. I was like, man, I just hope he doesn't jump across. There it. were things we caught too. Oh, really? Yeah. So that they, did he ever push back? Because it seemed like every time you guys pushed no, that's him, he the did, thing. He handled he, it. He took his beating, his verbal. Yeah, lashes. I mean, that's the. I, I will commend him for that. He sat there and yeah. took it, and you know, was very respectful to Fred. You know, even afterwards, you know, he was. Did he shake your hand um, when you guys parted ways? Uh, uh, I think he offered to. I don't. I can't remember did if I, he returned did you, did or not. You, did you reject his handshake? Like I said, it was so <laughs> awkward. Like I can't remember anything. I think anything I did reject his handshake. Yeah. I, I just did, wanted to end so I did, fast. Did, I did, didn't I? I rejected his. Uh, How's the episode done ratings wise? It's been great, right? Oh, it's. I mean, it's definitely been the. You know, it's, we've got a, we've gotten a ton of positive feedback on it. Yeah, and it's great. It's, it's been. But we've gotten a ton of negative and like people attacked us yeah. saying that. You know, this is what I don't understand is like we came from this like with pure intentions and other people said, you know, we're using it to get ratings, like we're giving him a platform. And there was a lot of negativity that I just it made me uncomfortable that people felt that way because we wanted it to be positive. For people her. love to ascribe intention with action like they like to say. But here's the thing. I don't think anyone who watched that. Uh, there may be a few, but but I don't. The vast majority of people didn't watch it and think, "Oh, the guy's a good guy." No, like, sure, he deserves yeah. a break. No, everyone, even watching it, my heart palpitated. I felt like a, a little bit of an adrenaline rush in certain moments watching it. Yeah, uh, I, I I I don't uh, I, I don't think he was redeemed in any way, shape, or form. I, so you're gonna catch you're gonna catch that, and you guys putting yourself out there so much and being the official. Bourbon or the official sure. podcast of Bourbon, uh, you're going to catch flack. But I've had the discussion with with Fred privately. Where it's tough sometimes that you got, but you just have to just oh yeah, it, you, gotta, you know, it, and keep going. So I'm I'm pretty well used to the to to the kind of like a public criticism, if you will, when it comes to like your work and like um, you know. And again, this is going back to like my regret about this is like, you know, I know that my actions in that interview led to a lot of what, you know, Kenny and Ryan got. And, and I, I feel like the way that we, we bonded over this episode is like, is like we, you know, we are partners in this, in this venture. And, but we bonded in this episode in a way that you cannot bond unless you, but we were, we were one. And, yeah. And like, and that was my big takeaway from it. You know, we got, we got, I, I'd say it was 80, 20, like 80% was positive. And we got a ton of like long letters, um, uh, people commenting in, in, in forums that had nothing to do with Bourbon Pursuit uh, about us. And, and it was like, it, it was, we had a lot of positive commentary, but the, the, the negative things that people came back with, you know, they have absolutely every right to say that we shouldn't have given them a platform I was a, a big dick, you know. They <laughs> yeah, there, we definitely, and, you know, right. people, and I'm totally fine with the criticism, like, you should have asked this or gone this way with interview, and I, like, I totally agree we probably should have, but like I said, it was so intense yeah, and awkward yeah. in that moment that, it's like, hard, It's you, hard to focus. It's like, it's like when you get into a fight, and then later you're like, oh, I should have Well, said it's this. like, you know, Mike Tyson always says you have a, you have a great plan until you get punched in the face, yeah. you know, and then you're like. Yeah, I mean, yeah, do you yeah, think I like, thought about, like, <laughs> When I sat down across from it, that my first question was going to be, "Why aren't you in jail?" <laughs> right. I mean, do you he think came out with that, and I was like, "Oh boy, I'm, I already <laughs> yeah. didn't want to be in here, and now we're now we're doing this." Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, that was, was not that was not scripted. I didn't think about that. I just just sat down, looked at him in his eyes, and felt all the emotion, and I was like, "Fuck you." <laughs> you know? Yeah, but it, I mean, it was cr like I had you know big brands. That was at an event, and big brand you know, in the whiskey business that came up to me and like thanked us, you know, said it was like, thank you for shining a light on that. Thank you for doing it. And I was like, it's like, y'all listen, like I did, I, this was for like the bourbon fans, you know? And, and I was, here's the thing too, is Ryan and God, I'm still so, I'm obviously getting back, worked back into it. I'm getting ready to hit the well, here we are. button. <laughs> here, here we are, like we did this interview before Bourbon and Beyond and at Bourbon and Beyond on my stage uh, with the Van Winkles is when Preston Van Winkle said that they, you know, worked with Facebook and everyone to, to shut down the secondary market. And this is what started it. Do you think, do you think for a second that um, the brands would be working with social media groups 
if there wasn't counterfeit going on in these in these really fun forums that we had created. Mm-hmm. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't give two shits. I. It depends on the brands. I, I don't know. I. They would. They would have. Let's put it this way. They would have less of uh, less teeth to go with. And they were one of the things that they continued to use is like the Dominican Republic and. And they're like, yeah, you're right. It happened in Dominican Republic, not the United States of America. You know, but the most counterfeited whiskey in the world is Macallan, right? So Macallan has taken. I think Jack Daniels is more counterfeit than Macallan. You think so? Yeah, Jack. Jack is pretty very. Like if you, uh, you, you should see some of the Korean labels. <laughs> it, it's well, like Macallan instead of. Uh, but, but Jack and Macallan on the high end, sure. Macallan super super counterfeit. So I think that it in my and I agreed with this consensus i think that if the van winkles wanted to really fight this and the real reason the honest reason is counterfeiting then they should spend that money instead of on lawyers making increasing counterfeit measures which i yeah. think you guys actually spend money addressed. on the labels right, spend and money stuff yeah on the you know that's what mccallan does they have the holographic label the, they, they've attempted to uh increase the security of yeah the that, i mean that's the crazy thing like people were sending us measures like you should have dug more into like how he did it and i'm like guys that would have lasted three minutes. He, it was as simple as but you heat guys sealing. It. Heat sealing. We did, we did but you they said we should have done more. You don't want to give them tips yeah. on. No, no, no. For anyone who's given you criticism on that, you don't want to give the real counterfeiters where to uh, where to focus their efforts on. Well, yeah, true. But, but I guess my point is is that these bourbon labels, they're they're so simple. They're they're easy to replicate the yeah. or the bottles themselves because it's simply just a you know a label and a heat a heat sealed you know. Sure. Cap, wrap, yeah. or your lap, or excuse me, I'm, you know what I'm trying to say, but anyways, the shrink wrap, shrink wrap, yes. Shrink, shrink so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it that that was what blows me away is that how, yeah, simple I, that I guess it easy is I, to it, counterfeit. It is simple, and even like at um, at Bourbon and Beyond, like at the end of the at the end of the seminar, uh, Julian grabbed a label and he scraped the back of it with his pocket knife. My first question was like, how did you get a pocket knife through security at <laughs> Bourbon? <laughs> I was like, I still can't get that on my head, like how he got through with a pocket knife. But it wasn't a, it was actually a pretty big blade. But he scraped it off, and that was like, their, he's like, this is what you do. You know, their whole thing is like reselling on eBay. Um, you know, but they can't go after that. You know, that, there's nothing illegal about reselling a bottle. An empty bottle, yeah. Yeah. And, and so they had, uh, you know, them working with Facebook and everything and all these other groups, they're trying to protect themselves. They're trying to protect their brand and, you know, uh, keeping from, you know, bad whiskey out there. But these groups still exist. They're just more fractured than ever. So I feel yeah, like it was a, not it, a vain attempt, but it's, it was a... Uh, look, look, these groups are not like cockroaches and rats. They're, they will be exterminated. You think so? Mm-hmm. Yes. I think I, uh, this I, is how far I've seen. And I think you guys, again, I think you guys did address <laughs> this on the show, the, br- the brown bear thing, right? Yeah. You remember that there's a group, I forget what it was called, but it was, there, there's one called, uh, uh, I'm not going to say exactly what it is because then I'll get hate myself, but <laughs> it's uh, something moving company, right? Anything for sale. I think yeah, I've put, seen put something the bottle next like, to a piece of furniture. But here's you, the thing. You see the like, furniture's for sale. I've seen like on those, a treadmill or something, treadmill for sale or, you know, it's pretty those, interesting. Those groups, the, the thing about those groups is, is the bigger they got, the more money that the, the sellers received. Oh, know? I know. It's, and so now prices aren't what they are now. And so when, you, they were. when you have a limited quantity in the group, you know, I mean, it, 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 it it de- yeah, it's definitely takes the, it, the mainstream of it and the ease of it. Like, as a but anybody could have got on, you know, and got in those groups and buy and sell anything, you know, and but now I, it's just a humans are incredibly resilient. I, <laughs> I do think that these groups are like the cockroaches may get smaller, but I still think they're gonna, yeah, be maybe. There. But the lawyers are in there, sure. Uh, the ABC people are in there. That if you live in Texas, I would not even be in a secondary group. Do, do you know what happened in Texas recently? Yeah. I mean, the, Texas is like, they're cracking down. Um, you know, recently, 47 at, uh, state attorney generals came out and said, this is going to be one of our top issues for 2020. Cracking down on secondary alcohol sales. I mean, for God's sake, we have human <laughs> trafficking. We have right. we have more methamphetamines on the streets than uh, and pills never before. I mean, every day I take my son to school, there's a part of me that is, wonders if there's going to be a shooter that drives up today. And yet, attorney generals want to like focus on the secondary market and fucking Facebook. Sorry, yeah, I it's okay. No, cuss all you want. But I mean, forgive me. 
give, give me a break. And it's, and it's like, and, and the one shred of evidence that they have of like, well, it could be meth, methanol or poison alcohol <laughs> up in hell is from the Dominican <laughs> Republic. And so they, they focus, they use a shred of evidence from the Dominican Republic. And area but that's that, all they need. They just they, need a fuse. They, they need, need, they need a fuse. Yeah. Not only are they using this to crack down on the secondary markets, they're going after shipping. Yep. They're going to crack down on the Drizzlies, the mini bars, and all it's going to take is one 16-year-old in Iowa or Idaho or New Hampshire to open up a box and drink his daddy's like it'll secondary probably, sales. It'll probably be vodka. No, may, it may not even be a secondary sale. It could be like an Amazon or something like yeah. that. Oh, okay. It, 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 they're going after. They're going to after, stop interstate or to stop yes, shipping. Period. They're yeah. stop. They're going after that. So all of these, all of these little like um, all that. That's the thing here. It's like you have to look at the bigger picture of what the secondary market is. The secondary market is not about like protecting. Johnny from getting uh, underage alcohol. That, that's not what it's about. It's about protecting the the, the beast of the of the industry, the three tier, three -tier system. system. Yeah, for sure. And the secondary market showed that there was a crack in in the in the market of what the market could provide to the consumer. And the the bigger thing here is the shipping. It is it, it it's the shipping. It's for it's for. Um, a distillery to be able to ship directly to you or a liquor store or whatever. You know, when you, if, if you, uh, um, that's the other crack that it's, that's the big one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big one. Well, and there's I, that place in DC that, that, you know, in Texas you can ship wine, but you can't ship spirits, but there's a place in DC. I think it's called reserve bar. That's also being sued by, um, they're part of that Magnus lawsuit. Remember? Uh, yeah, recently? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but they are shipping, you can ship your spirits to Texas through them. So that that's that crack is the other side of that three tier system missing out on money. And the, the three tier system recently lost a big uh, case in the Supreme Court. So you're you are yeah with uh, the total wine multi, deal multi billions billions and billions and billions. And the thing is, is the three tier system can comfortably you know live with yeah. the new the new world, you know. I don't care who ships me the alcohol, but if I live in Maine, I can't even get Elijah Craig. And th there's a good chance I can't get uh, Woodford Reserve Double Oak if I live in Maine, like a small pocket of Maine. And if I'm a bourbon fan, I don't want to drive to Boston. I yeah. want to get on my computer and, and have it shipped to me. Well, well, and the people it hurts too are like the, the craft guys, like starting up. I mean, you just can't go get distribution, you know, in every single state, you know, but say you have a fan in uh, California and you're based in Iowa or whatever, and they may be able to ship to them. But uh, yeah, it, it really hurts them. It keeps the, the top players at the top and it's hard for those bottom players to compete, you know. Well, I don't understand how in general with business, there's no protection for current businesses with competition. Sure. And like you, what happens when mom and pop stores can't compete with Amazon is they end up going away, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no protection for mom and pop stores, but somehow this three tier system is protected from the evolution of, of consumerism when it comes yep. to alcohol. We well, can, I'm glad you brought up Amazon because that's the, that that's the three tier system's biggest threat. Yeah, and that's our biggest fighting shot probably to ever break down because they are so big. And they've got the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's on our that's on our benefit. Yeah, for if sure. Amazon gets the ability. And Jeff Bezos has spent millions into this already. I mean, he spent millions into uh, to lobby, you know, lobbyist firms and everything. And the thing is, I don't even know if he can crack it. I don't because the way that the alcohol industry is set up after prohibition. Every single state became its own country, and to some respects, every county became its own country. Right now, we're sitting in Kentucky, but we still have dry counties. Mm -hmm. And even if a, dry, a county is not, is not necessarily dry, you may not be able to get a drink until like 4 o'clock on a Sunday. And you're in Texas, for God's sake. <laughs> They're moist. I mean, you've got all kinds of weird laws there. Our so, laws are horrible. But they'll gladly take the tax revenue oh, that's, uh, uh, yes. you know, that the other counties oh, are producing for Well, them. we're going to have some tax revenue here. Well, that's just fine. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, think there's, I, think there's, I think Jeff will crack it because there's, there's going to be a workaround that's very simple where, you know, uh, if they had... A, I know Texas has a shipping 
Amazon shipping center in Texas, right? And there's pretty much one in every state. Why wouldn't they be able to ship interstate and still hit that three tier system, right? Why not? Why not just treat it like an online retailer? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the big the big. So if we have any tech people out there, if you're looking for a way to make a lot of money, um, the the one thing that is is not happening in this world is there is not a, a a shipping company comfortable with shipping alcohol. Yeah. Not a single one. Amazon or, or uh, UPS FedEx and, and UPS. FedEx, they're like, oh, well, you well, Yeah, they don't want the liability. They don't want the liability. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you want to Amazon create should a, just do what everyone else does and say it's barbecue sauce on the side of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Throw a package of mac and cheese in there and shake it around. If Amazon started putting shakers in all yeah. that. Hey, it's <laughs> olive oil. Hey. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, you know, that that's the thing is like there's not – there's. You know, that's why you see like uh, like Liquor Barn here locally, they do the shipping. You know, so when you buy from them, they'll deliver it to your door. They're not using a third party for that. It's because it's a pain in the ass. Sorry, cussed again. No, you can say <laughs> ass. Actually, radio. ass is yeah. ass is okay on the radio. Yeah. Put, ass, an, put ass, another ass, lap ass, down. Ass, ass, ass. <laughs> Just is that case. too many asses? <laughs> <laughs> there may be a limit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, it's so that's okay. like even shipping laws. You know, kind of loosened up here in Kentucky, but. You know, FedEx or UPS, neither one of them wanted to hand yeah, take it on. Sure. They're like, uh, they're like, well, who's going to be responsible for IDing? Who's you know responsible? Yeah, yeah. For I think that's happens? the side it's of it. Like, is they're uh, worried about the kid thing. So they got to you know tie up some loose ends there. But uh, hopefully, it's coming. I mean, everything else has gone this way, and uh, it's going to happen. But it's just yeah, going to take this, a long time. This <laughs> is a, this is a larger conversation, Chris. But what are we doing in this country? I mean, when it comes to alcohol, I mean, it's like. <laughs> Or marijuana. Anything. It's like, oh, or even food. You know, I mean, we're, we're a bunch of, you know, fat, you know, roly polies in this country. I mean, I'm, me included. I mean, I look at a cheeseburger and it goes straight to my hips. But we, what do we, I mean, we don't teach any kind of moderation here. It's like, it's either, it, it, we're, we're an extremist country. It's like either we're oh, fucking nothing. binge drinking or we're, we're not drinking at all. <laughs> And, and, like, if you look what they do in France, well, they have their problems, too. You know, they start educating their kids at a very early age about how to drink, you know? And it's, it's like... That's the one thing. There's two things we don't address in school. We don't address... Uh, if you, I don't know if you've seen the memes, but they'll talk about, like, teach me how to do my taxes, how to <laughs> handle money. Right. That's not being taught in school. But, sure, when lava's underground, it's called magma. Like, what, the, what does that have to do with anything, right? So we don't address that, and we don't address... Uh, drinking at an early age. I think it, if it was more healthy, more normalized, mm-hmm. I think we would handle it differently. But we, here's a, here's another thing. So when we were growing up, what you're what, 35? 32. 32. You're 34. Dang, 34, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I'm 40. I'm 41. So we're all kind old of man river. We're yeah. all, okay, boomer. <laughs> I got me some gray hair. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things, like when I was growing up, um, you know, today today we have like. We're really about like celebrating women. Absolutely, we should be, and putting women ahead and like putting them in the right place and everything. You know, we should be. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we the thing is, is women are equals. Yeah. If 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 the conversation if if it goes from there, then we got a problem. You know, but women absolutely should be at every table that men are, and there should be an effort to make sure they are. But when when we were growing up, that was not the case, and now we see this movement. And I like what I'm seeing out of it. Of course. And and it's like I I would like to apply apply that kind of like forward like wake up. It's a progressive first thinking. Yeah. Progressive thinking. Thinking yeah. to everything. Yeah. But um, I think we're I think we are, but it's just slow in some I think, areas. Like, well, look, look, how, look how look how far <laughs> we've come in ten years with marijuana. I well, think I think we are and gay people and gay marriage. I think you just rights. have to convince you know the you know you have. I don't know why we're, we got into politics, but I love it. Um, so you, you have the, the liberal mindset of, you know, let's oh. always think of, careful, well. Careful with, those, careful with those words. No, I'm going to generalize this as possible. Big, if you say snowflake, we're cutting no, this no, off. No. So you have, well, you have liberals that always want to push forward. Like, sure. there's something broken. Let's do something about it. Let's, you know, push forward. What you need that, absolutely need that. The conservatives, you're like, they want to hang on to stuff, manage it. They want to manage. And it's like, right now you have us progressive type too much change not quick enough to change exactly so you need the good old days we have us pushing forward but the 
the, the problem is the conservatives don't know how to wrap their head around it and manage it. They don't know how to and, let go either. They they are you saying? Are you trying to say conservatives aren't as intelligent as progressives? No, 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 no. no, no, no I'm not no, saying no. they. I'm, I'm quite. Well, you have to have. You have to have the conservatives <laughs> to manage. I just, I just set that up. That's well. All. Here you have like. What are your if, thoughts if you're, on you're, the you have thoughts and you're <laughs> you're trying to push things too forward, like that's not sustainable. But you need a conservative to manage those yeah, thoughts to sure. make it work. And this is where we need that. Are you Let's saying get liberals together. can't manage thoughts? <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> yep, here I go. I shouldn't that's, have said that. That's the that's the, that's the uh, chief editor thinking of headlines. Yeah. Like he's thinking of headlines. See, I'm not, this interview goes. I, I, I Ryan apologize. Cecil says. I can't. Ma- I'm not made for thoughts. media. That's my problem. I'm just, too honest or I'm too. Just having fun. And that was that was wrong. Of me. I apologize, but I don't no. Remember. It's like that with any issue, you know. Sure. I'm going to so. take snippets of quotes of, of of you saying liberals don't can't manage your thoughts. Yeah, and, but that's how that honestly that that can be how media works. Uh, it can't go against you. It's all about right. Anyways, I love both. Both of them, and we they both in in this situation need it's to just come take. together. It's, it's yeah. yin, yin and yang. And, yes, and we don't need to just open the floodgates and say shipping my, go because there yeah. are some things we need to think about, right. like under and then. But we don't need to just stranglehold we, we this to, industry. We, what we what we need is what needs to be fixed is we need to have a company com, uh, apps set up just for shipping alcohol and other you know things. Uber. Maybe DHL. I why, why, why can't we do have like a way? You know, I've had a, I've had like of, drunken Uber people drive me. Like I've someone. I've definitely had high Uber. I mean, then Uber's <laughs> like I don't think Uber's the right way to go. Yeah, but my whole point with the, this bringing that up is like, um, we're we're in a time where there are some great things happening, and there's a lot of rights being corrected for yesterday's wrongs. I can't tell you like when I researched the book Whiskey Women, I can't tell you how many incredible women um, were cast aside just because they were women. Sure. You know, we had, we had women who were up for master distiller jobs in the 1940s, and they didn't get the position because the management was afraid that men would be looking underneath the stairs up their dresses. Just imagine that. Imagine that. Like, we could have had some of the most brilliant uh, master distillers of all time, and they were not allowed to have the position because some Johnny pervert was would be down underneath the stairs looking up her dress. Think about that for a second. That's what that's what we used to have in this country, and w- that's getting corrected. Yep. So well, I don't understand why we can't apply that same type of forward thinking to all of the the backwards ways. And we're still stuck in the 1930s when it comes to alcohol laws. Just fix it. Yep. I think we'll get there. I mean, I, 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 it's just going to be slow. And what's great, what I, I, I'm telling you, it, it was crazy. I want to say maybe 2005, Hillary Clinton had been asked uh, their thoughts on, it was like 1995, 2005, the Clintons' thoughts on uh, protecting the sacredness of marriage and that it should be one man, one woman. And then just 10 years later, now I know that politicians like to flip-flop and whatnot, but I, I think even within the Heights area where Todd lives in Houston, the Heights area has been dry since, oh, you don't live in the Heights, that's right, you live in Edo, <laughs> but uh, uh, Omara does. Um, the Heights area has been dry for, for decades. And in 2011, the only way, that, the way that government set up there is that they, it has to be unanimous vote. Yeah. And in 2011, no one wanted to allow alcohol. And then in 2015, they revoted, and everyone went. So it's like this: you'll reach a breaking point, sure. and progress picks up speed like a like a stone rolling down a hill. I think that look what's happened with weed. You're seeing it unanimously across the board, a bit more accepted. When 15 years ago, weed, well, get, here's the here's, liquor will get there. Liquor liquor has an, an enormous opposition right now um, that our community doesn't really fully recognize. That's the health community. Um, is is really working very uh, diligently and um, scientifically to suggest that you look at alcohol, you're going to get cancer. They're they're applying some of the same methods that they did to tobacco in the 1990s that right now. You think it's going to be that way? Do you think uh, right now that we'll you, look back on alcohol seeing, as being just as bad as tobacco? I don't. Th- I think a lot of these things are not true. Um, a lot of the studies, even you heard though, it, Fred says <laughs> tobacco doesn't cause cancer. No, <laughs> I, a lot of, uh, regarding alcohol, um, but even tobacco had its place. I mean, if you think about like the economy, um, you know, it, it, so my, my wife is a shrink 
And we, we talk about this a lot. That's got to be interesting. No, oh, our conversations are <laughs> How intense. does that make you feel? Yeah, yeah. I, I would love I in the middle of Fred being upset about something. She's like, how does that make you feel? Like, just like the oh, most demeaning, I think it's. Dismissive. I think that's cute that you think that's where she goes. Uh, <laughs> Straight to your it, insecurities? <laughs> no, she, no, she just, she just like, uh, she'll just like, nope, that's not it. And she leaves. And I'm like. <laughs> I lost. Oh, I said fuck again, you didn't I? And I said it again, right? Uh, anyway, so like, so let's take someone. Let's take someone who is. Uh, so I was in the I was in the military for for nine years, and one of the targets that the the anti tobacco people have right now is to get um, to take away smoking in the military. And the people who I don't smoke, uh, but the people who smoke say it calms their nerves. Now, let me tell you something. When you are when you're getting shot at, and you need a you need something to calm you need something to calm your nerves. So if smoking is what gets you through uh, the thought of someone putting a fucking bullet through your head, sorry, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I've never seen someone have laps. a smoke. Have a smoke. Uh, but you know, if you um, in, in a, well, it's like people. It's with any laws. Like can, we we can't allow people to think and like you said earlier moderate yeah. themselves it's like why do we have to have so much like are we that dumb where we can't like figure out things but where you know? but where the where that contingency is right is when people start overstepping their bounds and that that's that's where alcohol's done a really good job of making sure they don't target kids and we're trying to protect them from like even on the shipping side you know the alcohol industry does not want people to get you know alcohol under, in the hands under, of kids they don't want that Whereas the tobacco industry was like, well, here's a cartoon, kids. Here's candy yeah, cigarettes. Here's, some candy cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. you here's know? a camel. Yeah. Here's a here's a pouch of uh, of chewing gum. Mm. It's just like tobacco. <laughs> um, you know, so the alcohol industry has been a little bit more responsible than than uh, than tobacco. But right now, what you have, what you see is, you have these studies that come out and they end up getting proven false. But when something comes out and it's an extreme point of view, it gets picked up and regurgitated. You know, I mean, it, it's it's basically like like the flu. You know, it gets it, it gets picked up and picked up. And well, picked yeah, up. it's it's like everybody. They, you know, if you watch the news, you think we're in the worst time of history of mankind. But like when you think about it objectively and not what's just we're in the, the best time. We're in the best time. Yeah. I mean, like least there's no crime, major wars. There's no yeah. like we're not getting drafted. We're not. You know, it's like come on, people, just like think for yourself not what the news said or but that's like, that, that's <laughs> that other side again you're pointing out that's the liberal side they're the way that uh, they, hold on wait <laughs> why would you attack the liberal point of views now no, i'm not attacking anybody i'm just trying Was to just a rush limbaugh I'm, show all I'm, of a sudden i'm trying to explain liberal views so that the liberal side of it is this is why to, we need kenny here to keep us yeah. back on bourbon <laughs> we need to always focus uh we need we need to always be changing and we like to paint things it's the same thing that happens Unfortunately, the similarities between the two sides is in church, the conservative side. The, the churches love, my grandmother loves to say, oh, we're getting close. God's yeah. coming back any day now. Yeah. Every time she sees something in the news that's bad, she's like, oh, what does this world come to? It's the end of the world. It's this extremist yeah. painting of like, everything's the worst it's ever been. No, everything's the best it's ever yeah, been. Yeah, we're more now, connected. Your, gran we're your more grandma just heard you on the radio, right? <laughs> or was it my, your grandpa? My grandpa, yeah. yeah. He's a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, very anti-drinking, right? Teetotalism, yeah. and uh, he just heard me on the radio for the first time, and uh, sent my mom uh, or called my mom. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't text, you know. Eighty years old, he doesn't text. That's cool, um, though. But, yeah, that's uh, cool. Yeah, it was neat. So th the same thing happens on the liberal side. People like to paint this picture as like, oh, everything is so racist. Like, well, it's not as racist as it. We should still address it when we see it. Right. We should still strive for betterness. But but that happens on the regulatory side. People love to one instance in the Dominican or those instances in the Dominican mm -hmm. or one shred of something they're like oh everyone's going to die we have to stop this they right. use it as fuel for change and unfortunately sometimes they use it to keep us from changing to, mm -hmm. to keep us from progressing to a point where Amazon can ship to my house uh, it, it, it impedes progress it's used to either impede or to so I think we'll get there in Texas uh, two years last year they en enacted a law that allowed people to open carry we mm -hmm. had people at my work freaking out Meaning you can have a gun outside on your belt. Everyone can see you walking down the street with a gun on your hip. I don't know the gun laws here in Kentucky, but you can do the same thing here: conceal, yeah. conceal and carry. Be right. a concealed license. Yeah. So here in Texas, it's open carry. You can conceal or open. Yeah, it's constitutional carry. I think is what they call it. Sure. Right? 
Is that I, what they call I, it? I'm not sure. I don't know. But, but the people were panicking, thinking, I, I had some guy at work who's like, oh, you're going to get into a car wreck. Next thing you know, it's the Wild West, and the two people are shooting at each other, and it's not happened at all. Yeah. In fairness, that is how we think of Texas, though. Sure. <laughs> and the rest <laughs> the of the world. world. But yeah, yeah. It's still you like know, Deadwood I, and, and, and Tombstone. The, when, uh, having grown up in Oklahoma, I have a great familiarity with Texas. And uh, you grew up in Oklahoma. Yeah, explains a lot. Go ahead, Oklahoma mm. State, baby. So we both hate OU, so <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm talking to someone from OU, I'm like, we both hate Texas. We both hate Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but I love Texas A&M. So if you're a Texas A&M fan, I'm not really a sports guy. The show's on ESPN. I don't really. I mean, I watch football. <laughs> and I, I now watch. the the <laughs> show's canceled. <laughs> yeah. I don't like sports. Yeah. I mean, I don't hate sports. I just I'm not. In, I, I play fantasy. I lo- I watch uh, college football time to time, but it's not something I super dive into. But being Kenny Coleman, I'm gonna get back on track here. We <laughs> yeah. uh, we yeah, it's, you have no idea. Like we right uh, we do this random shit all day. We would have stopped. There. Yeah, if Kenny were here, we w- he would have prevented us from going down that rabbit hole of sure. liberals and conservatives. Well, let's, and let's get back on track. Now. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, no, I, I, it's a tool used to, to impede progress often. But I think eventually, when when progress happens, when they finally allow something, and they realize, oh, we can get all this tax revenue, and no one's, in fact, our state is now better off in every way. I mean, it's like Portugal uh, legalized; um, uh, they decriminalized all drugs all drugs mm-hmm. and the effect that it's seen it's seen a, a drop in, in addiction they've seen a drop of in, like violence they've seen a drop in everything like it, everyone's just chilled out at home or whatever I'm not saying we need to decriminalize everything but I, I think once we do see a step in one direction and people realize that okay we're fine you know it's like you step out of your house I'm alive so you know where to play devil's advocate like Kenny would um, you, you brought up the the liberal policies I see also on the right side the, the the far right politics overusing religion I mean this is something oh hundred percent oh, this yeah. is this is something agreed. that we can bring back into like the alcohol world yeah like, they, all they drink, uh, it's I, so overused I've heard it called like hijacking Jesus or something yeah. sure. for whatever agenda they want to using appeal, religion to control people yeah and that's a, that's I a look classic at example I look at uh, let's go back to your state for a second Joel Olstein oh Lord. You want to tell me that that God wants you to have that friggin' enormous house, forty million dollar home, yeah. all those cars? If, and if Kenny was here right now, his head would explode <laughs> because we're talking about Joel Olstein. <laughs> <laughs> like, Is he a Joel Olstein? Fan? No, 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 no. He just he's just like, like why are we topic. talking about yeah. Joel Olstein? On well, <laughs> I don't. You know, as far as I know, Joel Olstein is not a bourbon fan. No, so maybe. Maybe that's his problem. I don't know. I mean, I, I brought it back. You, I I want to get Joel Osteen on the show and have you there just so you can ask him why are you not in jail? Oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just continue your trend of I costing would, people. I on would shows. love to interview Joel Osteen. <laughs> Do you feel like you'd be that would be fascinating? Rough, mean to him? Um, one of the first things I would ask him is like, you know, what kind of product you're using in your hair. <laughs> you know? He does have great hair. And I, I would set him up like that and then ask him something. But, but seriously, like he's, like I just, he, he's, he's an odd bucket, but his hair, it's like, uh, like Rand Paul's the same way. And I've met Rand Paul several times. I just look at people Maybe like not. that with this incredible hair. I'm just like, how's your hair like that? You know? It's like naturally awesome. Yeah. I have a full-time stylist makeup crew. I know. I feel like, I feel like people like that, that like I can see Joel Osteen having like a, you know, hair fluff. Oh, he's so, definitely got people who, who do yeah. his hair that probably live in his house and do his hair for sure. Well, I know that you've got a, uh, a meeting or a phone call yes. in a few minutes. Yeah. At so, 10 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to thank you both for making this happen. I no, thanks for having us. Way. I'm glad and, we can. And also, man, I'm proud of you. Yeah. You've, you've uh, everyone like everyone like tries to find a, a way into this world and um you know you've done it i i Congrats, appreciate man. you yeah. I, I it means a lot coming from you i uh i've got i've always said that i think louisville's the tiniest town with the biggest voice like you guys it's a big small town you guys sure. have <laughs> well you guys are making national attention 
uh, from this little, relatively small state compared to you know Texas and, and but it's so much. The impact you're having is making waves. So you guys, I'm I'm super impressed with Bourbon Pursuit. I've I've you know I've watched you guys grow and, and expand, and uh, it's 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 hilarious to now know that uh, Fred invited himself to become a part of the show, which is <laughs> no. great, and that he was nervous meeting us. I think we were nervous yeah. about it. We're like, no, I, I wanted to do a podcast, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I can't do my own, so I want to. I want to go with the one I listen to, and, but I, and I'm on a lot. So. I think you guys have done a phenomenal job, and well, thank I think, you. It's... Uh, I, I do think you. I do. I want to be the first one to to say that I do think that you deserve a place in the Bourbon Hall of Fame, uh, because uh, I was slapping out a gnat. It's okay. That was coming at me, not, <laughs> not, not sl- yeah, slapping like a... that compliment right out of the air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I do, I do think. I appreciate. That. I, I think you'll get there too. I think it's undeniable the wave. The the the. T- it's never been a better time in bourbon. And, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Well, the, the history of bourbon, you know, every, the, the data we have on it and the historical anecdotes are based on consumption. And this is the first time in history that we have an entire new arm of tourism and, and media, you know, surrounding it. So, so, like, the history of bourbon goes like this. And that's always based on consumption. And so when everyone starts talking about the glut and these forms and everything, you know, that's really kind of an, um, it's, it's an uneducated approach because it's based on oh it's easy know, to have an opinion when you don't know what you're talking about yeah <laughs> and that's quite common in fair. this in this hobby uh, but it's flawed to say that we're going we're going to have a glut soon because i it, don't think it's a bubble at all i think what you're going to see is a yeah. pricing out of certain brands that are just so ridiculously expensive that people i've said it about armagnac lynn cantata rum I was Rump. drinking Armagnac last <laughs> night all, Ooh, all of these all of these spirits are seeing this bleed over of people just a couple years ago, last year, we got that uh, 21-year-old Lin Cantata for 75 bucks. 21-year-old bourbon, oh, several hundred dollars, yeah. right? No, probably a thousand. It like yeah. a, well, I guess would. Yes, you get pappy. Yeah, you so it, it's at I, retail. I think what we're seeing is an overflow, not a bubble, but an overflow of now uh, the the love and passion that we all have for bourbon is now bleeding over into other spirits, and and we're seeing how great rum is, and we're seeing how great uh, I don't know about mead, but we're definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> mead's not mead's not going anywhere. Yeah, no, but no, the Ar- I was just I just like Viking history, so I really want to write that. Ar- Armagnac and and rum and these other barrel aged spirits are starting to see the the love and attention from bourbon fans. I don't think it's a bubble. No, it's not. We have at least twenty years. No, it'll. Yeah. It's more of a. You know, the hockey stick will just flatten out. No, at I the think top. You, I think you know, what you will see, I think you are seeing an end to like the rabbit holes of the world. I think you are seeing an end to. Um, what do you mean? Like, I don't think you can. I don't think you can come into um, Kentucky with that without twenty million dollars and have an impact on a new distillery. I just I think the craft distillers um, in Kentucky. Because you're able to do it in Texas. <laughs> specifically in Kentucky. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Texas, you know, other states, you can create your own style and, and, and everything. Here, I mean, you gotta, you got to bring it. Mm-hmm. You, you're not going to – you know, think about it. Like Wilderness Trail, you know, they're on fire right now. And New Rift well, as well. I mean, they were they – were, their plans really begin like 2008. Yeah. You know, and so like um, – you can't do that now for what they did. And um, like Angel's Envy, Rabbit Hole, uh, New Riff, Wilderness Trail. I mean, these these are distillers that you, you could not pull off today for the amount of money that they did. And Before, to get the quality. Yeah. yeah. And by the time, so let's say you start a new distillery here right now in this, in this area without a brand. You know, it's going to take you 10 years to get any kind of notoriety. And by that time, you know, things will start pacing down, mm-hmm. you know, so you could see, you know, that, that's the, that's the big gamble. So like, uh, uh I think if you're going to start a brand, it's more, it's smarter to do it as like, um, as like a source brand. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, that, to get your start off the ground, I've got, uh, some things I want to talk to you about, uh, speaking of labels and Wade, there is something I <laughs> wanted to mention earlier, but we'll talk about off camera, but I appreciate your time. I know you got to go. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, brother. Yeah. Appreciate it, Ryan. Yeah, dude. Thanks guys, for having us. We, we deep, love the show. Oh, and, uh, uh yeah. are you about to sign off? Yeah. Fuck, 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 <laughs> fuck, 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 <laughs> fuck. Got it. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. Bye right, guys. <laughs>
Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. 